Hello everybody, welcome to Trader Merlin Show. It is your Tuesday edition. Welcome back. Hope you're all doing well. I hope you're all warm. Yes, I did see some people out there saying, I know we've got uh, Texas on a, I guess you call it a state of emergency with 4 million people out of power and the East Coast getting hammered by a big storm right now. So I hope you guys all stay nice and warm out there. I made it back safe and sound from the East Coast. Uh, just spending a few days out there. I love it. It's gorgeous for all of you on the East Coast. It's fantastic. Did a little trip to Rhode Island, Connecticut, Boston. But I'll tell you what, it's a nice place to visit. I sure as hell don't want to live there in the wintertime. I don't know how you guys do it. Anyway, hope you all did well uh, while I was gone. I know you might have missed the show on Friday and on Monday, but we'll try to uh, get back up to par, get back up to speed. So, uh, again, this is going to be an interactive show. I don't have a guest on today or any really scheduled for this week. So if you have any questions, send them on in. Of course, I know you guys get a lot of chat going on, which I love. If there's a specific question for me, put question marks in front of it as you send it in. And also, if you're new to the show, hit that subscribe button. All right. I received a bunch of questions over the weekend, and as I started off my day here, I go, you know what, what would I want to talk about with you guys? And of course, I want to answer what most of the listener questions are about. And there were two in particular that dealt with this concept of really talking about proof of stake versus proof of work. And uh, to me, it, it was... It was, yeah, it was good. Um, good seeing my video store. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, what did I do? <laughs> video store. Anyway, um... We will talk about proof of work versus proof of stake today, and I want to just explain the differences between those so you guys understand it as you may potentially jump into cryptocurrencies. Now that said, this is not going to be an exclusive cryptocurrency show. I will go over the markets. We'll talk about our top seven. I'll also talk about um, uh, natural gas. I made some day trades today, but nothing really exciting to speak of there. But uh, maybe we'll take a peek at those as well. So let, let's talk about the proof of work versus proof of stake. And I'll look at the two questions that came in. So for those that sent them in, thank you so much. First one was from Michael. Uh, Michael says, heard a report today that Bitcoin mining uses more electricity than Argentina. Can you explain the process of mining and what is being attempted for its outcome? If a mining algorithm is successful, what is the outcome? That's one question that came in. The other one was from Tim, basically said, can you explain the differences between proof of work and proof of stake? I'm glad you spelled it S-T-A-K-E, not S-T-E-A-K, because that'd be a totally different stake. Okay. Um, oh, yeah, that's right. Thanks, Big. I forgot I did take that picture in, uh, <laughs> at the GameStop. Was that kind of humorous? For those that didn't know, I, I took a... I was on the East Coast, obviously, and I took a picture posted to Instagram of me standing in front of GameStop. And the irony is, I'll see if I can find it. I actually have a picture of me standing in front of a Blockbuster video holding like the last two rentals I ever got at Blockbuster Video. And there's a subtle irony there because I do think GameStop will be ultimately just like a Blockbuster. And, you know, you're now starting to hear reports and news articles. Bloomberg, I think, just did one Wall Street Journal about these people who lost a ton of money on GameStop as they got suckered into this thing. I mean, we were screaming that from the day that event happened. I'm screaming on a guy, don't touch GameStop. All right, so let me start off with some graphics. I actually went and built out some uh, visuals for you just so you understand the mechanics of, of some of these cryptocurrencies. So... I uh, apologize if my animations are off. I was really rushing to get this done for you guys today. We'll start with proof of work. And you're going to look at a few here. Uh, the icons on the right-hand side, you've got Bitcoin, Litecoin. In the middle, you'll have Ethereum. These are the primary proof of work concepts. And what really what a proof of work concept is, so you understand it, in the nature of a decentralized network, which is what Bitcoin is attempting to be, Litecoin, Ethereum, remember, it's removing it from a centralized authority who's making decisions. In an effort to do that, you have to have multiple people. Can't be a central person, but a, uh, multiple people all carrying a copy of whatever that ledger is. And that's what each one of these blockchains is attempting to do. Proof of stake says that everybody who has a copy of that ledger and is mining, so to speak, can um, potentially reap the reward of it. So let me explain what the proof of stake does, and then I'll show you what the reward might be. It's going to be different for every cryptocurrency, but this is how these miners are rewarded for minting new blocks. Now, as I mentioned, right now, there are, what, 18.3, 18.4 million Bitcoin out there, which means we've got another two point something million left in, to be made, to be minted, and that's the job of the miners. So if we look at the screen here, miners uh, complete, uh, compete to solve complex mathematical problems. I'm not going to go into detail on the problem. It's basically this, just a math puzzle. I know it sounds really stupid, but let's take a visual. Let's say you've got... Um, 10 people around the world are each running a Bitcoin, we'll call it a node, right? That's where they have a copy of the ledger and they're mining the, uh, the cryptocurrency, whichever one, you, in this case, we're using Bitcoin. If you've got 10 of them around the world, um, basically you have all of them competing to solve the same puzzle. It's all based off of computing power called hashing power, hash rate. 
So the greater your hashing power, the more likely you are going to solve this puzzle. Whoever solves it first, right? All you have to do is, is say, I've solved it, show it to the other computers in the network. They validate it and say, yep, you solved it. That individual who solved that block of data is now rewarded with Bitcoin and whatever fees are associated with that specific block. Now you guys remember a bit, a block of Bitcoin data, all of the transactions that happen, happen about every 10 minutes, right? So there's a new block every 10 minutes created. So right now, the reward for a miner for solving one block of data, let's say 10 minutes, is 6.25 Bitcoin plus any fees that were made in that block. So it could be 6.25, could be um, you know, seven bit Bitcoin, eight Bitcoin, could be much higher than that as well. So that's their incentive to solve these blocks of data. Um, from there, you move on to the second piece, which is gonna be the, the side of it, which brings in the creation of blocks. So we call them a blockchain because all it is is a series of blocks connected together and it's just basically in sequential order. So um, right now it is uh, 1407, or sorry, I use a military clock, 208. So let's just assume that in another two minutes, another block will be solved. The miners will be rewarded with new Bitcoin to the tune of 6.25 Bitcoin. They get any of the fees as well. And they now start looking for the next block and the next block and just perpetually goes on and their job is to create this unbreakable chain of transactions. Now, there are a few others. As I mentioned, they're rewarded with fees, uh, coins and fees. And the last part is the structure of it. And I wanna talk about this because to run this can be extremely expensive. Now, there is an article out there that talks about how the energy consumption in the in for Bitcoin itself is more than that of Argentina. It's going to be much greater than that going forward too. And I'll, and I'll show you as it starts to build up more and more and more, more miners are coming into the space. Now it used to be that us as individual consumers could you know just turn on your computer, download the Bitcoin software, and you could start mining Bitcoin. Unfortunately, they have specific mining rigs. They're called ASIC miners. All they do, it's a specially designed computer. It doesn't do anything else but try to solve this puzzle. And it's built for what's called terahash, meaning the hash rate is incredibly high. Not only are there single units like this, but there are literally Costco sized warehouses around the world with Bitcoin mining equipment. As you can imagine, each one of those devices is gonna consume enough, a lot of power. But now you've got tens of thousands in one building the huge amount of electrical cost here is what's of concern to many people in the crypto space. And I think this may actually be an issue for governments around the world as well, where they'll start, you know, really start um, taxing high energy consumption businesses, which of course could hurt like Riot Blockchain and anybody else who's in that crypto mining space. So if you have questions or if I haven't lost you yet, type them in the chat. I'm going to go in here and now go one step further and visually show you how this works because as I mentioned there's more and more people coming into the space every day into mining and as more people come in they need to change the code they need to change the algorithm to make it that each block of data is solved in 10 minutes and here's how that works so let's say for example we're on a proof of work network okay let's say that this is Bitcoin and very basically I've got three different miners miner one miner two and miner three and each one has a computer that has one terahash that's th is terahash of hashing power, right? So we can make the statement that the network itself has a hash rate of three terahash, okay? Now with that information, we now can configure that math problem I told you about earlier, so that that three terahash could solve the block in 10 minutes, right? Because my goal as Bitcoin or the Bitcoin network is to make sure that that block time is 10 minutes, right? That's what we're benchmarking off of. We wanna keep that consistent and not have it be eight minutes one time, two minutes the next, one minute the next, 15 minutes the next. You need that 10 minute consistency, which is what we're striving for. Now, so with that, we've got uh, three terahash, block time is 10 minutes. Now what happens if, oh, oh sorry, uh, and then there's this thing called mining difficulty. That, as I mentioned, is how they increase the difficulty of that math puzzle that these miners are trying to solve. So now all of a sudden we bring in a new participant. We bring in a miner number four here and he has three hash rate. It's actually a mining pool. Now these are companies that you can donate to, if you will, or connect to and collectively they pool a whole bunch of different um, miners around the world. So let's say it's me, I don't have a terahash, but maybe I've got a couple giga hash, right? I can join this pool 
and all of a sudden I can be part of a much bigger pool. And so if this mining pool solves a block of data, I don't get the full six and a quarter, but I'll get proportionally what hashing power I contribute to that pool. So I might get 0.2 Bitcoin for it because I'm only contributing, let's say, 56 giga hash here. But notice what's happened. This is where it gets kind of critical for your understanding of block uh, proof of work versus proof of stake. Remember in the previous example, we had a network hashing power of three terahash. Right now it's six. So if the mining difficulty stays the same, and I'm just calling it 2000 as a reference number, if it stays the same, I ask you the question, how quickly should this network now be able to solve the block? The block? I'm gonna ask you guys to type it in the chat, see if you can figure it out. If the previous example was three terahash could solve that block in 10 minutes, how fast do you think that the network can solve that block now that it's at six terahash? Any guesses out there? It's important because this is something that is fundamental to the blockchain and to Bitcoin in particular, where they're constantly having to modify the mining difficulty. And the reason for that is this. If you have a six terahash and your mining difficulty stays the same, you've doubled it, your block time is five minutes, but you can't have that. You can't have it at 10 minutes or at five minutes. So what you have to do is you double the difficulty. So we've bumped the difficulty up to 4,000 and now our block time is back to 10 minutes. That makes sense? Because with that much hashing power, it's the probability of that block being solved in 10 minutes. So what they're trying to do is constantly keep this ratio uh, moving up. And as you see more hashing power come in, they're gonna be increasing proportionally the mining difficulty. Now, what happens if we go to the next example? So I, and now we've, we've dumped, doubled it again, right? Miner number one bought a, a whole bunch of mining rigs. He's now up to seven terahash. Miner number four is still at three, but collectively it's 12 terahash of hashing power. Now, if we keep that difficulty at 4,000, this block would be solved in five minutes again. And they have, what they do is they now would bump up that difficulty so that it takes 10 minutes for that block of data to be solved. Now, I know that that's a whole lot of stuff. You're going, what? This doesn't make any difference to me. I just want to buy Bitcoin. <laughs> Frankie Shop says, who or what controls the mining difficulty? That's a great question. There is a, an organization that just, I believe the organization is the one who's modifying the difficulty, totally proportional. And it, it could honestly, it could just be a simple algorithm because they can check and see what the hashing power is on the network, right? If all of the miners are connected, inter interconnected, then you should be able to see very clearly what the total hashing power is. My assumption would be that this is gonna be an automated thing where if all of a sudden you see you know, a thousand terahash come into the equation, it'll right away get bumped up to accommodate for that thousand terahash, right? But I don't know 100% on that one, Frankie, but my assumption would be that that's gonna be an automated person, automated thing, not somebody sitting there going, well, let's, let's add another difficulty increase. So let me show you here real quick uh, some graphically to help drive home this point a little bit. Here is, let's see, mm -mm -mm. All right, so real quick, I'm, you can always check the blocks of data too. And you guys remember at the very beginning when I started talking about cryptos with you, I told you that if you know anybody who believes that people are using uh, cryptocurrencies for illegal activities that you should just slap them in the face and, and, and call them an idiot or anybody who says that that's what's happening. Look, here is your Binance pool. I, these are all the blocks of data that have recently been solved, right? So this was a, a, a nice one, a juicy one. See the reward column here. This is what these, these miners have been paid for solving that block of data. So let's just look at this one here from Poolin, right? This was the group that solved that block of data. It's a mining pool, okay? So they, I'm gonna click on this. Hopefully I'll get it. And what this is gonna show you is a couple things. I'm gonna scroll down because you'll see, uh, 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 uh you'll see the reward right here. It was 6.125, which is what you get for solving the block of Bitcoin. But they also received 1.1478 Bitcoins in fees. Now I know that you're like, oh, it's only, it doesn't seem like much, but 1.4 Bitcoin, you're looking at what, 50, maybe $60,000, $55,000 in fees plus the 6.25. So I'll just add it up here real quick because the, the total for these guys was what, 7.39. I'll just do 7.39. I'm gonna times that by 47,000. 
So basically, who, this group here that solved this block of data just made three hundred forty-seven thousand dollars. That should that, this is a crazy number. It's happening every ten minutes. Um, some great questions here. So ML says, why do they pick ten? I don't know. You know, this is something that um, for me will for always be a conundrum. I think that it, it, it's like this. Every block of data has a weight, right? It's transactional volume. So if we if you go too small, let's say you did a block every one second, right? Now I'm looking at, of course, 60 transactions per minute, and I'm looking at um, 60 transactions per hour, and then double 24 hours. All of a sudden, the block of data, the chain itself would be so unbelievably massive that it might be cumbersome. So I think that there was some thought at the beginning, he said, let's make it 10 minutes. Now, look, you could look at Litecoin. Litecoin is two and a half minutes. Uh, Ripple's like four seconds. EOS is like one second. Ethereum's about 15 seconds. So every blockchain or cryptocurrency or project is gonna have their own settlement time or block time. So that's if that's uh, something that's critical to you and you're investing, which it is for me, make sure you know which cryptocurrency you're getting into, et cetera. Because as I keep pointing out over and over again, you know, it's not a saying, oh, well, crypto is one thing. It's, it's multiple facets, right? It's transactions, it's programmability, it's store of value. Those are the three main groupings in my opinion. So to me, um, yeah, Brendan, nothing for you, buddy. We're just talking crypto. Beat it. <laughs> anyway, uh, I wanted you guys to see this because you can scroll through and see, you know, how much they were rewarded, what the, what the fees were, et cetera. And it's the same thing for Ethereum. So here's Ethereum, let me zoom in a little bit. I just picked a block uh, at random here, and as you can see, you scroll down and tell you how big the file was. So this was 38,000 bytes, um, and it also, it tells you the difficulty rating here. This is a, I don't even know what number that is, but it's a gigantic number of difficulty, and yes, they are modifying that. Now where are the fees with this one? So basically what this miner got and again ethereum is done about every 15 seconds guys so there's a lot more blocks being solved of ethereum and of course the reward is going to be much less that said the reward right now is two ethereum per block plus the fees well you notice here that there's 2.223 and i'll highlight it for you guys this is the combination of the fees total right so that's how much this miner made for solving that and let's go to i'm gonna do 4.23 887 and times that by what Ethereum right now is trading about, let's call it uh, 1720. I'll say 1730. Um, that's 73, that's $7,300 this individual made in 15 seconds for solving this block of data, right? That's just how these miners work. Now, Ethereum, going back to our original discussion, is a proof of stake. And the arguments against proof of stake are this energy consumption, carbon footprint. For me, I do think that this could be the focus of regulators, uh, energy companies as well, saying, hey, we need to do something about this because it's consuming so much power. It's bizarre to think that in one year, the Bitcoin miners, just Bitcoin alone, are consuming more energy than Argentina. I mean, that, that's a pretty phenomenal um, consumption stat. And here's the graphic to show you that one. This is from the BBC, I guess Cambridge University pulled this one out. Um, you can see obviously they're nowhere near what the US is. China leads, by the way, in energy consumption. Um, but we will probably see Bitcoin overtake Sweden, Malaysia, Vietnam, Poland at some point here in the near future. And what's nuts is I go to Vietnam and I mean there's so much electricity and power and lights and stuff just to think that the, the energy consumption for Bitcoin uh, is that high and then you add in you know, Litecoin, you add in Ethereum and, and many of the others. And right now, proof of stake, I would say, is, I, I don't know an actual percentage, I'm throwing it off the top of my head, but I would say it's probably like 70% of all the projects are using proof of work, right? Proof of work, where they're actually working to solve a problem. So, uh, that said, I've got a good friend of mine who is a graphic, he's a, um, I'm not a graphic designer, he's a, a graphics guy, right? 3D animator. He has a, a rig at home that is just super robust. And what you want is a real high power computer to be a proof of work miner. So this guy, when he's not doing his work, he just turns it on and he's mining different crypt cryptocurrencies in the background because he has a great system. If you just got a standard home computer, you're probably not gonna mine much, so don't even bother. That said, questions on proof of work. Anybody got any questions on proof of work now, which is basically the Everybody in the network competing to solve a puzzle, whoever solves it first gets the reward, done. Um, while you guys, if I give you a second to send in questions here, the big risk here is 
what's called a 51% attack. All right, and this is something that is a genuine concern in the Bitcoin community, where if one individual, one node of that controls more than 50%, so you get to 51%, you control the company essentially, right? Same thing in the crypto space. What happens if someone gets past 51% of the hashing rate of the network, they can now put in fraudulent transactions. So I could say that this account right here has 30 Bitcoin in it. And since I control 51% of the votes, if you will, because every, you know, if you, if you have all the hashing power, you can basically make the network say what you want. That is a real problem in crypto space, which is why we want to make sure that these things are decentralized as much as possible, because if any one entity has more than 51%, it does open the door to potential fraud within the entire ecosystem. All right. Uh, let's see. I saw some question marks go through here. Who or what owns the mining difficulty? Da -da. Does increasing difficulty increase energy consumption? No. And that's great. You were actually right where I wanted to go with that question. So let me show you this. Oh, where did I have it? Uh, uh, um, I, I had it here for a second. I might have taken it away. Um, if you just type in... Oh, where was that? Um, Bitcoin energy consumption or hash rate so there was a, a website I think it's total hash rate yeah this is it right here so here is the hash rate uh, going up now it's interesting when you guys saw that graphic that I just showed you about Argentina and how we just passed Argentina that's when we were at a hundred and I believe 140 M on the hash rate I don't know what that 440 million Terra hash we're already over 180 or 160 so it's already spiked up significantly from the time that article was written. And it, here's the three-year trend. I'll show you guys the three years. This is basically telling you how many people are jumping into the space of hashing. They're getting more and more involved in the mining of Bitcoin. It's, it is big, big, big business. business. Um, so that's the hash rate. But now look at the network difficulty. So here is the last three years of network difficulty. You guys can see it has steadily been increasing as well. It's up almost fourfold. And this is because so many participants are coming in. Um, to answer that question earlier where Tom says, does increasing difficulty increase energy consumption? No. Increasing the difficulty, in my mind, would be a result of increasing energy consumption, right? Because as more hashing power comes online, that's more energy. So let's to me, those two things are equal. More hashing power means more power, more consumption, right? So if hashing power is going up, then power usage is going up. In that case, they're gonna to have to mess with the difficulty. Now you do see sometimes where it drops, right? And you probably think, well, wait a minute, why is it dropping here? Why is the network difficulty dropping? Because there was probably a sharp decline in mining uh, of hashing power. What happens is a lot of miners will rotate from one cryptocurrency to another. They might be mining Bitcoin and all of a sudden they'll switch over and, and maybe they jump to a Litecoin or something else that their system is tuned for and use their equipment where they feel they might be getting more bang for their buck with regards to mining rewards. So you do see it drop sometimes. Uh, this is a three year period. So you know, it dropped, dropped pretty significantly in this uh, from 2000, October 2018 to December of 2018. Um, yeah, big. I like that one. But the ones bitching about it I don't own any crypto. Well, I would, as an environmentalist, as someone who does care about the environment, I would, I do make the argument that look, there's got to be a better way, right? Or maybe you put a limit on the number of hashing power, right? You don't have to have everybody maxing out and racing to have warehouses full of mining equipment. To me. You know that there there might be a better way. Now Ethereum has been proof of work since inception, and right now they're in a transition to go to proof of stake. So let me explain proof of stake. So now you guys can see the both sides of this uh, formula that's been run by most of the crypto world. Proof of stake. It's not like it's brand new. It's just they couldn't really figure out the mechanics to get it to work properly, and now they have. So with proof of stake, what it is is instead of you being a miner and you're just saying, I'm buying a computer, I'm going to run a node for this cryptocurrency and hope that I get the solve the block. Now you're just saying, I'm staking something. I'm going to take some of my money, put it in a basically a lockbox, and keep it there, and now I will be allowed or rewarded for solving blocks of data. And it's only the people who have staked or put in that money in that lockbox. Let me make a visual for you. Hopefully it makes it easier. 
So let's uh, explain a couple things. Cardano and NEO um, are, are a couple of the really major ones out there in the proof of stake department. That's the Cardano logo and the NEO one should pop up here in just a little bit. Now, basically, instead of having a miner, you have what are called validators. A validator, again, if I wanted to be a validator on one of these proof of stake networks, I would have to put in a specific amount or more of their currency. So let's say it's Cardano and I put in 100 Cardano. And now because I've done that, I've locked it in this box, I'm committed to it. I am now a validator and I may be chosen at random to mint a new coin, right? And I'll explain that here. So the validators mint or forge blocks of data. Remember, there's no super competition here anymore. There's no super competition. It's now just, all right, luck of the draw. All right, this one now gets to create the block. So they saw the block of data. They get the, the, the mining fee, if you will, or the, the validator fee, and they get the fees associated with it. That's how they're rewarded, is rewarded with fees. Um, on the grand scheme of things, there might be, re Brandon says proof of stake is extremely expensive in terms of capital versus energy. Um, Yes and no. To me, it's not necessarily a cost because the if you're in a proof of stake, you're just committing your capital. You're locking up your, it's not permanently there. You're not there forever, I don't believe. You can remove it from there, um, but you are locking it in. And the reason that they want to, you to commit that is if there is a problem, if there's, if you, if you record or try to put in a fraudulent transaction to the blockchain, then you lose your stake. Right, so it's a the penalty is you could lose your initial investment. So you don't want to put any bad transactions. The whole thing here is they're trying to make sure that there's no nefarious activity going on with the reporting of transactions. Right, they want to make sure that if I send Brandon a Bitcoin, it gets there, or if I send him a thousand Cardano, it gets there without somebody tweaking the code or trying to put in a fake transaction. That's the big problem. Um, so here's how it works visually. And this is a basic example. Certain networks will look different, but I wanted to give you guys a little bit of a, um, a visual on, on what it looks like, because I know it's kind of confusing. So let's say we got five individuals. Pick any five people you know, and let's just call it the, the Merlin coin, right? And you wanted to stake. You wanted to be a, a stakeholder, a validator. So each one of these people is now committed a specific amount of capital. And I just put it in dollars here, but it'd be whatever that cryptocurrency is generally. You can see number one put in 100, number two put in 200, three put in 500, four put in 900, and five put in 300. So basically what this ends up working out to is a percentage thing for these guys where the probability of them being selected is based off their stake size. So number four probably has the best chance of being filled here because uh, of validating the block because he has the most money locked up, right? He is staked the most. So he'll probably get 45% of the blocks are going to go to him. But this is the simple way that they, the proof of stake model is trying to work. If selected, that validator collects those fees for each block mined, okay? Now, if the validator makes mistakes or verifies erroneous transactions and people in the network catch it, they may lose part or all of their stake. To me, that is a, a pretty, pretty scary thing when you look at, you know, proof of stake versus, pro versus proof of work. Uh, Brian says, people's argument against Bitcoin is that you could 51% it if you got enough electricity to overwhelm the network and hash. Yes. Uh, it's not just necessarily electricity. It's just getting the hashing right. Proof of stake, you could do it with enough capital. Correct. And th therein lies the conundrum. The proof of work model from everything that I've read, and I've read some seriously geeky stuff, that's the most secure as long as it's decentralized, meaning you don't have anybody with over 51%. That said, that would be the most, the safest one. There are flaws with proof of work, or sorry, proof of stake. With proof of stake, well, I'll give you the big, the biggest flaw that I can see. Let's say that I'm selected as a validator and I've got, let's say, ten thousand dollars staked, or whatever that currency is, to be a validator. And I don't know if I can discover or find out that I'm the one solving this block of data. I could put in transactions that are worth well over 10,000, maybe a million dollar transaction. And if I can get away with that, then I keep it. If I don't, I lose my 10,000. So to me, there's a lot of, and that's an extreme example, but to me, there's a lot of flaws here with the proof of stake. But what I like about it is it no longer takes a supercomputer. It's not based off hashing power. I could literally do it with this computer I'm running this show from, or my laptop could be a validator because it's no longer about processing power. It's just saying you've been selected, you get to solve the block, not solve, but you are given permission to mine that block, right? It's, it's very, very simple. So those are the two main systems. So for those that sent in, Tim, 
um, and others, yes, it is relatively energy consuming for proof of work. Of course, the more people that come into it, the better. Uh, that said, it's more energy consumption. The challenge is with Bitcoin now, you know, kissing fifty thousand dollars over the weekend. Thank you very much for my portfolio. You know, more people are going to start to get enticed by this. You know, it's very clear when you look at that chart I just had up there. Let me see if I can bring it back up for you. Um, it's very clear when you look at this chart here that the interest is now in mining Bitcoin because they are they're constantly raising and raising and raising that difficulty limit to make it keep that block time at about 10 minutes. Uh, here's the total hash rate again for the last, this is 24 hours, let's go three years. You know, you can see a significant increase and it doesn't appear to be slowing down anytime soon. There are a couple of little blips down there, but you know, uh, overall, the trend is your friend to the bend at the end on this one and it looks to me like we're gonna get more and more energy consumption for Bitcoin. All right, I'm not gonna go into the other ones. There are a wide variety of them. If you're not sure, there are different sites that you can go to. One that I really like a lot, at least for explaining these things, it's it's called, um, it says, are we decentralized yet? It's a, it's a lengthy one. I will put it in the chat here. Hopefully it comes through in the chat. You guys can use this one and check it out. Um, I like this one because it, it, it tells you a little bit about the different cryptocurrencies. Are they, you can see here a consensus, that's the generally the algorithm that will be used to solve the, the math equation. And you can see there's POW, which is proof of work, POS, which is proof of stake. Uh, there are several other ones. You've got FBA, POI, you've got uh, delegated proof of stake, Tangle, which is one that I'm very interested in. I don't own any IOTA, but I am very interested in the Tangle or a directed acyclic graph is really what that's called. Um, but you can see here, Dash, Dogecoin, Monero, those are all proof of work. Uh, Sia coin, Bitcoin Cash, Ethereum Classic, Zen, all proof of work. That's predominantly what we're seeing uh, in this space with regards to cryptocurrencies is proof of work. But uh, Ethereum right now is trying to switch over to proof of stake. And right now, Brandon, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe it's 32 Ethereum that you would use to stake for light or for Ethereum. I think it's 32 or 33. Um, you know, that's no small chump change. Let's just say it's 32. If I times that by, you know, 1730, which is trading at, that's a $55,000 commitment. But think of it like this. If I took my Ethereum and just kept it in cold storage, I'm not making much, right? It's, I'm just making the appreciation off the underlying asset. If I take, you know, $55,000 worth of Ethereum and keep it on something like a BlockFi or an exchange, which will, a DeFi exchange, which will pay me some interest on it, well, now I might make three, four, five percent per year on it. That's great. I could also stake it and potentially be getting these mining rewards or validator rewards with commissions. And right now, Ethereum's fees are pretty high. Um, if you notice, the block reward time or block reward for Ethereum is only two, but each block is getting over two Ethereum worth of fees. That's a lot of fees out there. So um, I still haven't done it. Uh, I, I'm very, very tempted to take 32 Ethereum, it's 32, and stake it. Um, that's a totally different thing for me. A um, little, little wary about sending it that much there. Yeah, it was, uh, Brendan says you can get 4% on Ethereum on BlockFi. I don't know what, what the what the actual payout would be for you know staking but I, I'm debating trying it I'm, I'll, I'll let you know if I do it it's just I'm a little wary about staking ethereum because that's, that's a lot 32 ethereum is, is quite a, quite an amount there all right guys any questions on staking for proof of work versus proof of stake I'm, I'm hoping I answered the the multiple questions that came in on that one from some of the viewers um, I know it's uh, something that's very Different, right? It's 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 a new it's a new language, and I'm hoping that um, the brief discussion helped Michael understand how people saw blocks of data, what it means, the reward, uh, and the question came in um, on one of the shows last week, which was, once we reach all Bitcoin is in circulation, which is going to be 2140. Yes, we will all be dead by then, but so let's not worry about it. But if once that happens, you know, what's the reward to keep the network going? Because there's no mining reward anymore there will be the fees for the blockchain. There will be the fee reward will be what people are mining for. That's right. Oh, okay, cool. I didn't know that. Brendan, we might have to talk offline about that one because I really want to do it. I'm just wary. I just, to me, it's like, oh God, you know, putting up 32. Uh, of course, right now I own zero. I haven't bought back in yet. I'm, I'm looking to uh, buy back in. Uh, great, Thomasine. I'm glad you guys, I'm glad you enjoyed it. I, I thought some people might be turned off by the topic, but you know, it's, it's the backbone of how these cryptocurrencies function. I think it's important that we don't buy something blindly. We know 
what we're buying into and hey, why not know a little bit about the mechanics? To me, proof of work versus proof of stake are so vastly different in how they function and, and what it means to their respective networks that we should know that. All right, let me see if I got other questions. I did have some other questions, so let me um, go through here and try to find those questions. Mm -mm. Oh, I had to throw this one out there. For uh, You guys might remember we were talking about, um, and this is from Brandon, not Brendan, so it's a different B, uh, but last week we were talking about MJ, and I, someone sent in a comment early in the week, it was like, who, what, where, why, when would you buy MJ? And, and we, you guys might remember, we were talking about, I'm not buying it right now, but you know, why don't we sell some puts? You could sell puts at 24, and someone's like, oh, $20 is my target. And it's like, look, there's some good demand levels down there right around that 24, 23 level. And I guess Brandon bought into it. Um, he says, Merlin, I put on, I put in an order to buy MJ at 23.50 after your show last week, it was filled Friday, sold half at the end of the day today. Where's your target? I ask you, Brandon, where's your target? This isn't my trade, this is your money. So how about you next time, you send it and say, I bought some at 23.50, I sold half, my target is blank, and then say, what do you think, right? So at least let me know what you're thinking. <coughs> All right, so let's go look at MJ, because MJ uh, had a, a decent day out there, if anybody's trading the, crypt, uh, the cannabis space. Nice little bounce up there, and I mean, you talk about supply and demand work, and that was a beautiful one. You got this nice rally base rally, and all of a sudden we came screaming back into it in two days, hit right that 24, and bounced off of it. So had you sold those puts, you most likely would not have been executed yet because they, they, no one would exercise those options quite yet. You wait until it gets close to expiration. So most likely you were never executed anyway, and now you're still click, keeping that premium as MJ moves up. Now, my question for Brandon here um, with regards to MJ is this. What were your, what, what is your overall thought on this trade? What were you looking to do, right? You, you bought it at 23.50, and congrats, that's actually a great spot. I'll put a line right on the screen so the viewers at home can see where 23.50 is, and then we'll map it out from there. So there's 23.50. I mean, you basically, it tiptoed right into your zone, kissed it, and bounced out. Awesome. Now, you said you sold half today, uh, so I'm assuming right around 26.80, 26.90, somewhere in there, because this came in near the end of the day. Um, what what was your thought on this? I mean, for me, thinking my thinking was you're buying it at 24 and you're going to hold it for a long time because I'm very bullish long term on the industry. That would have been my tactic. Would have been a much longer term hold. You know, you're looking at a couple day trade here. That's that's very very short term. Um, you know, at this point, it's really up to you. I, I I don't. I would just be holding this and moving a trailing stop and locking in profits as it continue to move up. You know, if you're going to look for specific targets, well, you're going to have to split this up because. In that four-hour window, look how much MJ fell. I mean, this was, I have to go hourly to maybe find any sort of stops. And there's nothing here to really tell me that there's a good zone until we get back up to around 35 bucks. So I would be more of a buy and holder now um, on your MJ that you purchased at 23.50. Let that second half run. You're playing with house money. So um, congrats on that one. Uh, let's see, Merlin, quick question for you, CFD, certificate for, yeah, a contract for difference, right, uh, what are they, any thoughts, I have them available to me on my platform, um, you know what, it's been such a long time since I've used those, when I actually built some educational material on CFDs years ago, and I was working with a, a bunch of guys out of the UK, and the general consensus is this, they are all gambling tools, like they are basically gambling tools that are in favor of the house, um, what I need to do, Brandon, is I would need to do create some graphics just to help explain it. Um, so maybe I can do that one for us, is do a little bit more uh, graphic work and create a, an explanatory thing on how CFDs work. I know Brand, um, Brandon Wendell uh, was trading those. I just did it from an educational perspective, never actually traded them because when I, when I went to this British bank, uh, basically they asked me to build this class for OTA, or actually it wasn't for OTA, it was for the Italian company I was working with years ago. They asked me to build a CFD class. I'm like, sure, yeah, no problem. So I ended up working with some guys, again, out of London, because it was it's really big over there. And they they took me into one of the brokerage firms, one of the banks. And they had these these monitors that we normally keep horizontal. They turned them vertical so they could see the order book. And remember, CFDs, at least the way these guys are doing it, it's not directly connected to the exchange, meaning you could buy a CFD, like a binary CFD to say, all right, the S&P will be at, it won't go below uh, 2780, right? And what they'll do is 
they're not quoting the actual market, they're quoting you their quote on the market. So while the S&P 500 may not have got, never gone below 2780, they could show you on their platform where their quote for the S&P went below 2780 and it would take everybody out of the equation. So what they were doing is they were modifying the numbers on their own data to tweak and take out stops. And they basically would just go, oh, see this big group of people that have got stop orders here or they lose everything if we go one cent past this number and they would tweak it past that number make everybody a net loser and then the price would pop right back up and I was like okay this looks like an absolute scam run by big banks and I was like nope not for me so that was my my basics of it but I'll see if I can create some other stuff down the road um good around the 2350 mark bought some MJ yeah I mean I think I think you're looking great on MJ I mean that was a great pullback that was a beautiful pullback and, and it actually lined up perfectly with what we discussed on that show which is why what, what the hell are you doing trying to buy it at 35 right wait for a pullback that pullback in my opinion was a little bit extreme I'll bring up the daily here but I, I think we all agree it was it was pretty predictable it was gonna have a pullback right the next day that that big red candle there that was a little larger than I thought I thought it would take you know a week or so to crawl back down to this level and then bounce back up but all in all that's a pretty nice move up there for um, MJ and I think you're probably in a decent spot right now okay I did not do anything with regards to earnings calendar I did not do anything with regards to uh, economic analysis because I was too busy trying to get this whole crypto thing done for you guys. So uh, I will do this. I will real quickly kind of run through some of the earnings, at least the major names for tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow you've got Twilo, Energy Transfer Partners, Shopify. Uh, Shopify, I'm going to bring that one up. This is one that is just gaining more and more popularity and the price of Shopify has just gone absolutely crazy out there. Congratulations, Larry, for calling Shopify when it was just like like 150 bucks or something. But here's your daily Shopify. Let's turn this into a weekly. Um, this is just a phenomenal chart. Obviously, it looks like it's getting long in the tooth, but it will be probably, oh, do I get to use my crazy graphics packages? Yeah, it'll probably be your popcorn trade of the day. Now, that's going to be before the market opens tomorrow. So, you know, obviously, most of the action is going to be gone by the time you wake up, but you'll have a lot of, uh, of crazy waves out there. If Shopify ends up having a monster gap down into a demand zone, that might be a nice price point, but you gotta, you're you not using anything that's close to current price for these things. You're using way away from current price, especially on an earnings announcement. That's uh, going to be a very wild one. What else do we have? We've got Baidu, uh, Mosaic, and Marathon Oil are some of the big names that are coming out with earnings tomorrow. Now, I will look at the Forex Factory calendar here, see what I've got for you guys for tomorrow's session, since we're already on Wednesday. Crazy. Oh, yeah, tomorrow's actually a good one. Uh, you do have retail sales numbers coming out tomorrow, which is probably the most significant one. Now, what's interesting about retail sales is the previous number was actually negative. They're expecting it to jump to 1.1 from a negative 0.7. I'm great if it does, uh, because historically, we always seem to oscillate right around zero. Slightly above it, slightly below it, slightly above it. But the current trend going into to, uh, tomorrow's announcement has been every number has been weaker than the previous month. And it's just, it's now we're all of a sudden below zero. Does that mean we have a protracted uh, sell-off lower? We'll see. My guess is you'll probably come in line with expectations right around 1.1%. I think it might be a little bit less than that. Um, Australia has unemployment rate. Other than that, it's a heavy day for the U.S. You've got capacity utilization, industrial production. You've got business inventories and a couple of Fed guys speaking. So it should be a fun, wild day out there tomorrow. Um, as I mentioned, I don't have a guest scheduled for the show for the rest of the week. So uh, I, I might see if I can squeeze one on later on in the week. But right now, I've got nothing, nothing cooking. So I will be doing more topics for you guys on uh, whatever you want me to talk about. Larry says, if I set my profit target zone, can the market maker stop me out? Totally depends on where you trade. And this is a good, good question because there is the belief that market makers see your orders and they're going to stop you out. And no offense, Larry, how much are you trading with, brother? Are you trading with 50 grand, 100 grand? I mean, you're trading with under 100 grand. No one's gonna be like, dude, let's take this guy out. Let's mess with this guy. Maybe for a joke between two buddy, you know, two market makers, like, oh, I'm just gonna take this one guy. They don't really get anything out of it. Now, if you're trading, you know, tens of millions, it's a different story because that, that's a pretty big trigger. So us small fish, it's one of the beauties I love about what we do, is we have the ability to get in and out very quick without people really seeing us or, or, or manipulating us. Can they see your stops? It depends on your brokerage firm. It depends on who you're trading with. So for example, if you send your orders through on a Robinhood, yeah, they see every single stop loss. And since they sell those orders to Citadel, Citadel can now 
see your stops. So they could potentially be taking stops out. If you're direct access and going straight through, then no. Because again, sometimes the orders will be kept on your local computer and sent once the conditions are met. Other times they're sent through to the exchange, uh, to the uh, the broker that you're using. If it's sitting on their server, then they see it. No, there you go. Right, yeah, right. We're we're for most again. Like, I wasn't trying to be mean, but we're mostly you know none of us here are trading with hundred million dollar accounts, right? We're probably trading with hundred thousand, two hundred thousand, somewhere in there. Um, the bigger footprint you leave, the more likely you're going to get messed with. Can they see it? Yes, if it's at their brokerage firm. That's the answer. <clears throat> Uh, Tom says, as an e-commerce guy, Shopify is just another e-commerce platform of the day and the long line including Magento, Big Commerce, Volusion, all the way back to IBM, WebSphere, and Yahoo stores. Yeah, <coughs> but what they've done, Tom, is they've, they've kind of dominated that space. They seem to come out as the big player out there. Are they overvalued? I don't know. Can't make that assessment. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't buy it right here. I, I want to bring Larry on to talk about the fundamentals of it, but... Um, I mean, that's obviously one heck of a chart when you look at what it's done over the past couple of years. Here's going back into 2016. I mean, um, Larry was telling me about it in 2000, I think 17 is when he added to his portfolio. Uh, you know, that thing was 70 bucks back then. It's pretty amazing. All right. I think that's going to do it for me. I'm going to go enjoy some of this sunshine after spending uh, you know a few days out in the frozen tundra of the East Coast where it's really, really cold. Um... Oh, Arky, you want to know about Rocket? I want to check that one out before we check it, before we uh, wrap up here. Rackspace Technologies, reporting earnings. All right, my big issue with uh, Rackspace is, historically, there's not a ton of data here. I'll go to the daily. Um, let's see. Earnings on February 25th was thinking of buying at 2030. So a couple things that you can do here. And again, this goes back to the topic we we discussed many times here on options and that's roughly uh, 2034 $20.34 cents uh, what I would do Rob is this if you if you tell yourself hey I want to buy at 2030 you could right now be selling puts because as you go into earnings the premium that you're gonna get for those puts is gonna be much much more so if you like it right now at 2514 you could be selling that 2030 put now I don't know how much money you're gonna make on that put I mean it, it, it varies but if you want to buy there at 20, 30, 30 anyway, then sell those puts. Sell them tomorrow. Sell weeklies, right? And just collect that premium. And if all of a sudden it gaps up or gaps down next week on bad earnings and drops to you know 20, 50, you're still not going to own it, but you still get to keep that premium. If it drops below 20, 30, yeah, you're going to own it. And you know, depending how far it drops, you'd be potentially losing. But I would do that. That's what I would be doing is is using the options, collecting that premium. And if it you know has a huge gap up, no harm, no foul. You still keep your premium. That's what I'd be doing there. All right. So there you go, Rob. Hopefully that helped you out. Um, I got. To, oof, God, Brandon, negative fifty. Ugh, ugh, ugh. Um, now nah, it's funny. I went to visit a friend over there, and we went out for a. Uh, I get there and I'm, I'm red eyed. I'm jet lagged. I didn't couldn't sleep on the airplane. And we get there and it's cold as hell. Uh, it's it's 19 degrees. I'm looking like Ralphie from Christmas Story. I'm all bundled up. It was actually hilarious. Um, oh, I'm sorry. This is RKT. RXT. I um, thanks, Rob. <laughs> I don't know why I typed in RKT. Ooh. Um, okay. I'll tell you the the story in a second. But uh, this totally changes everything, Rob. I I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. And the reason, yep, I got you. I fixed it. Um, you're so close. You're thinking about buying at 2030. You're so close to current price. I wouldn't do it. Especially coming into earnings. Because you know it's earnings don't just gently come in. And you, lately, it's these big gaps. So I would probably, oof, and it really hasn't done much. I mean, this thing has just been sideways. I, I don't see a lot of, I mean, other than maybe if you're thinking long term down the road that this might be the, a play. Um, you know, you do have a little bit lower. I'd be more interested somewhere, like maybe down to just go to twenty dollars. I'm I'm cutting thirty cents off of that. Um, yeah, I don't. Uh, yeah, no, I, I. I don't know. You're probably not going to get much on the options either. This well, I guess it's fairly liquid. Um, yeah, I, I. I tell you, Rob, I'm not really that keen on buying it. I just don't feel like it has a lot of sense of direction. Uh, if you think or know they're coming out with some good numbers, then that might be a play for you. But I don't know. I'm not a big fan of the chart. It does look like, if we look at historical patterns, it's got this period where it goes up for like two weeks and then sells off for three weeks. Well, 
we're almost at that buy point again anyway so nah i would have to i would probably say nope on this one and it's nothing to do with the company it's just the chart and going into earnings too risky for me so yeah so we get there uh, it's it's 19 degrees and i'm tired and she goes let's go for a walk a walk in 19 degrees you know i'm thinking like southern california you go for a walk and it's like 60 70 like 60 you're going ah, I'm, not, I'm not i'm gonna stay in it's, it's cold outside so we go for this walk and the wind chill has got to be like negative five but they're just like oh let's sit outside in the bench i'm like now nah, we, we got to go inside man i'm i'm a fair weather guy i can't deal with this cold weather stuff <laughs> learn a lot about my my tolerance for frigid temperatures over there on the east coast over the past few days i am a total wimp when it comes to cold all right <sighs> Brendan, t-shirt weather is 19 degrees, huh? I don't know. Well, more power to you. Uh, my wardrobe is probably half yours because it's just shorts and t-shirts and flip-flops. <laughs> All right, everybody, that's going to do it for me for today. Um, if you guys have questions, want me to cover something, want a specific show for tomorrow, send it in sooner rather than later so I can spend some time building it out. As you guys know, these things take some time to build. So send them on in. You guys can always email me. Uh, TraderMarone at gmail.com is the easiest way to do that. If you are new to the program, hit subscribe. If you like today's show, give me a little thumbs up. I always appreciate that. If you didn't like today's show, that's fine too. Just let me know what it is. Don't be one of these haters that uh, talks trash and doesn't say anything. Just just email me. Let me know what you didn't like about the show. Uh, maybe we can make it better. That said, everybody, have a great day. Hope uh, you do well tomorrow, and I will see you for our Wednesday, Wednesday edition. Wow. Take care, everybody.